Oh, okay. Hold on a second. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> okay, friends. Thank oh, you, sunshine. Okay. Thank you, sunshine. I got you. Yeah, you're right. Now there is audio, right? Welcome, dear friends at Kardec Radio. Thank you. The microphone was muted. Go figure, huh? Thank you, friends. By the way, welcome to Kardec Radio. And we are here talking about Lifting Hope, a program that is all about therapeutic conversations on the book Memoirs of a Suicide by the Spirit Camilo Botelho. Through the medium, Yvonne Pereira. Yvonne Pereira is a Brazilian medium who received this information not through psychography, not through automatic writing. She brought this book to us by hearing the Spirit Camilo say it, by seeing it, by seeing the scenes of what he's describing, as if he's watch she's watching a movie as well. And Leon Denis, the Spirit that revised the book, inserted more information to us. So this book is about hope because it talks about us in a multidimensional complex. We're spirits, immortal. We don't die. We are enveloped by a spiritual body, the peri-spirit. Kardec named it the peri-spirit because it envelops us. And then this peri-spirit is connected to the physical body multidimensionally. That's why the peri-spirit is semi-matter. And it connects to the physical body when we incarnate it. But let's not forget, the permanent life is the spiritual life. This life we're living here on earth, it's like going to school. We go to school, come back, go to school, come back, go to school, come back home. Home is the spiritual body, the spiritual realm. Okay? The more we study about the true life, the permanent life, the spiritual realm, the more we will work upon ourselves. I know people who have studied spiritism. When they grow older, they, they say, oh, I've read it, I know it. No, no, no. Read it again and again and again. Why? Because... These teachings, the Spirit say in the Spirit's book that the more we study about where our priorities truly are, the happier we'll be. We'll be able to face death with beautiful eyes. Death is not bad if, and only if, if we're facing it in natural ways. When it comes to suicide, you see throughout this book, it's suffering. But there is hope. And why this book, Memoirs of a Suicide, is about hope? Because this book shows to us how to manage ourselves as immortal spirits and gain new emotional social skills. Suicidal spirits committed suicide because they lacked emotional skills. Yes, there are emotional and weaknesses of the soul. But if you see, it's not about the intellect. Because we're talking about suicidal spirits who were intellectual beings in their previous life. So it's essential for us to work on ourselves like Jesus taught us. The best school of emotion is named Jesus School. Yes, you have it. It's free. It's free of charge. It's in all of our hands. When we go to the gospel according to spiritism, and we study the virtues we need to acquire. Patience, resignation, calmness, forgiveness, humility, 
joy of living, tolerance, and so many others, kindness. We are going to learn from these several spirits, selflessness, and taming those conditionings of the past, making us strong when facing the needed learning experiences. Okay? And that's what this book is all about. And that's why Mother Mary is at the forefront of it all. Because Mother Mary was the spirit who gave herself to bring the life of our Master Jesus to the earth. She sacrificed her life from beginning to end to the point that she was witnessing the very murdering of Jesus. Did she go crazy? No. Did she feel depressed? No. And she had all the reasons to. Why? She is the living lesson that it is possible to face the worst adversities and not fall apart. That's why she is in charge of all the ones who need a hand to rehabilitate themselves and learn what she knows. Resilience, endurance, humility, selflessness, etc., etc., etc. So she's working side by side with Jesus to help us in that journey. That's why this book is about hope. You and I will one day be able to get there. Right? Welcome to Kardec Radio, friends. I can see you. Thank you for helping me here. Hello, Raquel Bakeshi. Hello, Carol Correa. Hello, Sol Souza. Thank you for being here. Hello, Renata Santos. A big hug to you. Hello, Sunshine. Thank you for helping always. I know. Hello, Nora Brasil. Hello, Daisy. Daisy Galan, how are you? Hello, Jailton. Hello, Andrea Cosley. Hello, Lisa Telles and Teresa Castro. Hello, Alan Swift. Thank you for joining us, friends. Hello, Patricia Miranda. Hello, Silvio Otero. Hello, Elisa Geisel Rodrigues, how have you been? And I can see more friends joining in. And if I haven't said anything, you can write your comment, your hello. Hello, Mariam Weldo. Thank you for joining us. Yes, you know, Mariam, this today is a particular chapter that may be so current as well. From the beginning of the chapter, we learn a beautiful lesson to the end of it. So, ready? Are you ready? This chapter is very comprehensive. I have all the highlights prepared for us, but let's see if we can go through all of them. If not, we'll break it down in two, okay? It's about chapter 14 of the book Memoirs of a Suicide. It's titled Actual First Attempts, but here we are highlighting the main focus of what we want to discuss. So you remember that they were learning about the preciousness of reincarnation, the preparation, the physical body. You remember that, right? Yes. Two days had passed since those events. Days when we seriously pondered everything and learned during our visits to the various hospital departments. 
we could not possibly hold on to any illusions after having concluded the clear and wise lessons we had learned in each one of the departments. We were extremely troubled. You see how people who commit suicide, they are always like, they are always depressing themselves. They learn the beautiful things and instead of rejoicing, being happy and moving forward, they are always like in the gloomy side. There are people who are like this. They enter spiritist centers. They hear the most beautiful things. They, they go home and say, oh my gosh, since I learned about spiritism, I feel so much more guiltier. And I say, how come? Spiritism is the promised consoler. It's Jesus that comes back singing the hymns of joy. But Vanessa, it's about responsibility. Wonderful. But it's about action and reaction. Wonderful. Because we're talking about cultivating seeds of joy and love. What you cultivated in the past. The past is in the past. Let it go. Let it go. But Vanessa, I'm suffering now. Okay. So start. We start right now. Planting new seeds. You need to eat. You need to nourish yourself. So, there's no time to say, oh, I didn't plant last year. Imagine if the, the farmer had a problem in the previous year, didn't sow anything, and stops and says, oh, my gosh, I didn't plant anything. We're not going to eat. The farmer says, okay, we're going to plant now. We need to cultivate now and move on. That soul of Tarsus, when he transformed himself into the Paul we know, he didn't look back and was weeping about it. We need to change that complaining attitude. That complaining attitude does not get us anywhere. That voice that keeps telling us, I'm not a good person. I'm a bad person. I did so many wrongs. Well, it's not going to help. We need to stop that. Because that just makes things worse. But how am I going to make sure I'm not going to do it again? By seeking the good, feeling the good, visualizing the good, and molding the good with all the resources we master. We can master. Emmanuel chapter 10 from the book, Thought and Life. Okay? Now, you see illusions. We could not possibly hold on to any illusions after having concluded the clear and wise lessons we had learned in each department. So question for us, do you have illusions? Who doesn't, right? We do. That's why we incarnated to learn how to rid ourselves of illusions. They were troubled in our somber room amid longing and solitude. We saw the tears that bathed each other's faces. So this is Camilo. He's talking about Bellarmino, Mario Sobral. On the morning of the third day, Roberto de Canalejas, a doctor, once again helped us out of our depression by inviting us to take a walk with him in the park, which wasn't a walk in the park, okay? Because he's going to learn a whole lot. But you see a technique? Go walk. With his usual charming, discreet, and simple affability, he warned us as we walked. Okay, now, big open ears. Let's listen to Dr. Kanahelehas. Discouragement is always a bad advisor. And we have no fight against it with all our might. We have to fight against it with all our might. You need to snap out of it, my friends. Fight against your depression. 
by turning your will towards the supreme power that emits all the energies that nourish the universe. And you will instantly sense a regenerating disposition, enhancing your ability to proceed on your journey. When you feel discouraged and downhearted before the inevitable, do a bit of work. If you find yourself in a crisis, seek new opportunities while worthwhile and honest activities to restore your faculties. Whether on earth as incarnates or in the invisibles as discarnates, we are never too insignificant and powerless to serve our neighbors, working for their relief and well-being. Instead of imprisoning yourselves in this world, giving in to gloomy and unproductive thoughts that only aggravate your sufferings, come with me to visit a few of your brothers who are suffering even more than you and who are still hospitalized, immersed in the darkness that used to cover you. Let us return to the hospital in order to revisit friends, colleagues, the nurses that assisted you so kindly, by consoling your pain-stricken hearts and the doctors that helped you expel from your minds the usual thoughts that deadened your spirits. Okay, we're going to put a pause because this is huge. This is very, very, very important. Discouragement is always a bad advisor. We have to fight against it with our might. What is discouragement? It's what many people are feeling nowadays. Uh, the world is terrible. Coronavirus is coming. The end of the world. Oh my gosh, everything is going to upside down. It's so pessimistic that nothing, nothing gives joy. And he says, fight against your depression. He gives tip number one. How do you fight against depression? By turning your will towards the supreme power that emits all the energies that nourish the universe. We'll say something that may be strong, but it is true. If we really, really, really put God as the center of our universe, will never be depressed or discouraged. I will repeat it three times. If we, we put God as the center of our universe, we will never, ever, ever be discouraged or depressed. But Vanessa, I believe in God. There are people who believe in God as a satellite. Yeah, I am the center of the universe, but God is not giving me what I want. They believe sometimes in God as another galaxy, not even belonging to ours. In those cases, we will be discouraged and depressed at some point because we are not all powerful. We're not self-made. We're not self-sustained. Only when we put God as the center of our lives, we will be invulnerable to discouragement. Discouragement is what? When we no longer put our hearts into our lives. When we're split. When God is no longer the source of our nourishment. But what do you mean, Vanessa? God is always nourishing us, of course, sustaining us. But 
It's like a child. Look at a child, little one, or a teenager. The parents are there working hard, taking care of them, but their self-centeredness makes them take everything for granted and even feel not loved and abandoned. And it's shocking. Because you're there, you're working yourself out. And the self-centered child is not realizing that. And feels, oh, daddy, mommy, don't look at me. They don't pay attention to me. You see? It's not God's problem. It's our problem. Because God is evident. Only the blind don't see God. So, I will repeat here what Dr. Roberto de Canalejas is teaching Camilo and others. Fight against your depression by turning your will towards the supreme power that emits all the energies that nourish the universe. And you will instantly, instantly, he says, Sense a regenerating disposition, enhance your ability to proceed on your journey instantly. Friends, Jesus said, love God above all things, meaning everything I do. God, what do you think? What do you think? This way or that way? Jesus was always consulting God. We need to get back to it. And I say back because in previous lives, we, in religious traditions, we talk so much about God, 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 but in a way that was imposed that nowadays we're so distant from it. We need to res rescue the true sense of God-centered life. The best way to combat discouragement is to think. You are not the universe. You are not the center of the universe, neither am I. Thank God, because it's too much work. Who is God? But do we accept God as the center of our lives? Are we worshiping God the way we need it? We need, it's a law of worship. It is a law in the universe that we dedicate our lives to God. Not to ourselves, to God. Some people say, I need to spend more time on myself. I think you need to rephrase it. You need to spend more time with God. More time with God. That's the only way for us to combat discouragement and depression right rosaline rosa thank you daisy for putting that out there when you feel discouraged and downhearted before the inevitable do a bit of work yes there are circumstances that are hard but we need to ask what can i do now if you find yourself in a crisis, seek new opportunities. Mama Bia, these are like, a, it's a recipe book. Write it down. First one, put God the center of your universe. Instantly, you will be re-energized. Second, he says, seek new opportunities, worthwhile and honest activities to restore your faculties new opportunities come on you may be there oh my children it's the empty nest oh really what about the universal family we can't leave that small life go from work to home home to work that's very small we need to expand our universe, make connections, 
learn about new skills. Go do a piano class, an art class. Learn something with your hands. Look at Jesus. I'll, I'll share something with you that the mentor Joseph shared with me many years ago when I was still at the SS, SSB. He said, Vanessa, look at Jesus. Jesus used his hands. And he's the governor of the planet. He made this planet. He used his hands as a carpenter to make things. He fished with Peter and disciples. He could be like the scribes or the Pharisees, the intellectuals, right? Not really getting into the labor, manual labor part of it. Look at Paul of Tarsus. How did he make his living? Was he a weaver? Yes, he used his hands to do it. So mentor Joseph said, you also need to work with your hands. Of course, cooking, cleaning in our daily lives, that's normal. I cook and I enjoy learning more about cooking and cleaning and doing laundry, but he said, learn to do knitting, crochet, painting, piano. Why? Because we need to use our full potential. We can't be only amongst the books, reading, philosophizing about life, meditating. No, we need to use the body right? Work out physically. And nowadays, you don't even need to go to school. You have YouTube. With Mentor Joseph's incentive, I learned how to do like Brazilian cheese bread on YouTube, even kneading on YouTube. Why? Because we have to do it. We can't be lazy doing the same old stuff from beginning of life to the end. Because that's what people do. Children are always exposed to the new. And then when we become adults, we restrict our learning opportunities. Dr. Roberto de Canalejas is saying, expand your horizons. That's why many people are going depressed nowadays. Because when we enter certain phases of our lives, we think we need to be restricted to those three, four things every day, three, four things every day. No, we need to expand our horizons. Always learn new skills with the hands, with the head, with the heart. And then he's going to say something that is of the most importance. Instead of imprisoning yourselves in this world, and we would say, instead of imprisoning ourselves in our homes, giving in to gloomy and unproductive thoughts that only aggravate your sufferings, come with me to visit a few brothers who are suffering even more than you. Okay, so this combating discouragement and depression has three steps. First, and I will quote from his words, because it's like a recipe. Ingredient number one. <clears throat> Turn your will towards the supreme power that emits all the energies that nourish the universe. So turn your will to God. Your will. Meaning. God, you're the center of my universe. What do you want me to do? And I'm saying this because I have the microphone here and I'm just looking at it as the center of the universe. So, God, how do you want me to do this? Life is never going to be sad again because the heart of it all is God. 
courage, right? Cur, heart. Two, two, seek new opportunities, worthwhile and honest activities to restore your faculties. We're never too insignificant and powerless to serve our neighbors, working for their relief and well-being. And then three, three, visit a few brothers and sisters who are suffering even more than you are. That's the recipe for combating discouragement and depression. What do you think, friends? Nowadays, many people are going through this, right? Here we go. God is everything for us. And then when we are open-minded and want to expand our horizons. And three, when we think of those who are suffering much more than we are. If you are at a hospital, you may think, but I'm sick, what can I do? Think. There are people who are in that hospital who are sick or even more than you are, and they don't know what you know. Sometimes the nurses that come, the doctors that come, they are also very troubled in their lives. So by being there in a mindful way, with courage and faith, we can be of help to those who are around. If we are in prison, if you're in true jail, we can also be of help to those who are there suffering much more than we are. We're not saying we're not going to cry. He's not saying, don't cry. No, you see, this message is not saying, don't cry. He's saying, do not be discouraged. Do not lose your heart. Take heart. In Portuguese, we have an expression, bom animo. Take heart. Take heart. See the new opportunities. Honest, worthwhile activities we can do to be of help. Nobody, he says, nobody's too insignificant and powerless to serve the neighbors. Oftentimes we are suffering because we're just like children who are so self-centered that they feel they are so spoiled. That they are like, ah, oh, they throw a tantrum. I'm so sad, what's happening to me? Why is my life that way? Open your eyes. Your parents love you. Everything is fine. That toy that you want, not necessarily the toy that you need. Come on, give me a hug, right? Mm -hmm. Think about it. Let's think about it. Thank you, Kara Correa. She summarized here in the comment section the points, right? Yes. Yes, we need to be a good child before God. I agree with you, right? So let's return to the hospital. And they followed him. They acquiesced, okay? They returned to the ward in that evening and they started their, they went to the earth to visit the earth. 16 years had passed since Camilo discarnated and they were going back to Portugal, his homeland. And it was hard for him. In this chapter, you're going to see that it was very hard for him to go through certain areas of the life on earth. What is interesting and we want to highlight today is that when these spirits have these excursions to the earth to help people, did, you, did we understand what they're doing? They are coming to the planet earth, like to the incarnate level, to help people who are feeling discouraged or who are sick or who are suicidal. 
but they do not invade people's homes to rest. These spirits, they have a higher conscience. They don't, he says. Decency and respect for other people's homes kept us from seeking shelter in the houses of strangers. As far as our old friends, even though they would not be able to see us, they were even more deserving of our respect and we did not want to indiscreetly intrude on their privacy. So, of course, accustomed to the comforting discipline of the Institute, we walked the streets longing for its kindly refuge. Uncontrollable sadness clouded our hearts as the sunset spread nostalgia all around, increasing the gloom that had stricken us. Bellarmino suggested that we seek shelter in a church, whose interior filled with believers openly invited intrusion, but I declined, faithful to my former incompatibility with the clergy. Okay, suddenly, as if the fraternal kindness of Theocrito were watching over us via magnetic screen, so they were helped, our steps as we had done with Geronimo, an idea illuminated my mind and I exclaimed joyously, Fernando, Fernando de la Cerda. The unforgettable guardian whose charitable thoughts of love and peace, transmitted in scintillations of prayers, had visited me so many times in the fearsome disconsolation of the darkness, where my soul was expiating the audacity of having anticipated the determination of the righteous law. Yes, Fernando. And it sounds like a, the song, right? Fernando, but it's not. It's another Fernando, this Fernando Lacerda. He's a medium in Portugal who was in the, his daily profession a police detective, but he was a spiritist and a dedicated medium who also was a faithful worker connected to the hospital Mary of Nazareth. He was incarnated. The kind heart who in his charitable and tireless way continued to captivate me with his constant visits in thought his affable embraces converted into beneficent radiations of prayers for better days on my way. We knew the location of our friend's residence and the location of the office where he carried out his honest work. We also knew the location of his favorite spot where he and some colleagues conducted scientific and instructive experiments. Just a few days with Fernando and his companions were enough for me to readjust to earthly events and social life. I spoke extensively with the medium that was so loved by our institute. In the warm ambience of the rooftop shelter, I gathered my ideas and outlined a plan according to Theocritus' recommendations. First of all, I had to inform my old friends, colleagues and editors, even my enemies, that suicide had not actually ended my life my intelligence or ability to act. Speaking to Fernando's mind via friendly dialogues that I, that I found to be greatly comforting, I made use of his hand as a glove that covered my own hand and wrote long letters to old friends, telling them that death had not brought me oblivion. He identified himself, but, however, despite my goodwill, and the dedication of the friend that loaned me his invaluable assistance, I experienced the disillusionment and shame of being rejected by nearly all those I wanted to serve by revealing myself to be an independent, normal thinking being and a living intelligence. I was disappointed and vexed. I'm going to pause here for a second. Because this part of the chapter talks about, first and foremost, how you and I can be of help. Can I ask you to do one assessment in your house? Is your house a safe place for these spirits who come in excursions and need to repose in between their tasks 
But Vanessa, that does that mean even my house cannot be my house? But our homes need to be beautiful temples of God. That's when we put God first. We can't have hidden areas, secrets, dirty things, hide things in the closet. We've been there, done that. Our house needs to be clean vibratorily. How do we do it? First start from the physical, diminishing the clutter, keeping it simpler physically, giving away things that you don't need. It's going to make the vibrational field better too. Revisit the habits within the house. If I use my house as a refuge to cultivate ill feelings, addictions, this house is not going to be an outpost for them. If you want to serve humanity, you can prepare your house to be a spiritual outpost for these spirits who come in excursions to help people on earth, they can rest in your house. Fernando de la Cerda was this Portuguese medium who communicated with Camilo and other spirits, prayed for the suicidal spirits, helped them out day and night. He was the Chico Xavier of the Portuguese lands at the time. And yet, Camilo wrote letters through him, the incarnates didn't believe. You know what they claimed? That it wasn't pure, the style that came through. You know what it is? Ignorance. Mediumship is about instrumentation. So, I may have a piano. If it's not, if it's not well tuned, no matter how great the pianist, the sound's not gonna come clean. Some people only believe when they see the purest, and even that, they don't give in. Look at Chico Xavier. Many people didn't believe the things that he brought to life. Many people doubted Chico, including spiritists. Did you know that when Chico Xavier psychographed Andre Luis books, many spiritists didn't believe what he wrote? And to date, I know people who read Andre Luis books and think that it's too much of a fiction. Is it Chico Xavier's problem? No, it's our blindness that is creating a problem. So in this part of the chapter, we're going to learn that we need to revisit the way in which we can also be cooperative by preparing our homes, making, giving priorities. Priorities. But Vanessa, what about my family members? Well, you need to help talking to the family members. Mm -hmm. Educating them too. Sh sharing with them that the actions that they take in the house have consequences, reactions. We won't be protected if I tune in into programs that are violent, that are scary, that are sensual, that are towards any forms of addictions and conditionings or inferior tendencies, we need to change it. When they feel the difference in vibration, they themselves join in. They feel, man, it makes sense. I feel so much lighter by doing this and not that. And they perceive 
the difference in their spiritual environment according to our things. And drinking at home, no, 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 no. Spiritism doesn't prohibit it. But our understanding and what this book talks about, if you have a bar in your home, shoo, dissolve it. I know a friend who had a lot of wine bottles. He called me to his home and said, what do I do? Throw it away. Oh my gosh, these wine bottles, Vanessa, they're so expensive. But they're poisonous. If you want to use them in your food, that's okay. But if you're going to drink them, or I'm going to give it to friends. Oh, then you're not a good friend. Because huh? it's poisonous. If it's not good for you, why are you going to give it to friends? But Vanessa, this was so expensive. I said to him, do you want me to do it for you? I can do it. You can go away. When you come back, everything is going to be gone. Oh, my gosh. I said, when you're ready, let me know. And then one day he was ready. I said, okay, don't worry. So I opening, shh, pouring everything through the drains of the, the sink. And then it was just about recycling the bottles. You, you're going to give the bottles of this alcoholic beverages to friends if they are not good for you. They are not good for others. In this book, we get to know clear cut every single chapter that drinking alcohol is a form of suicide. But, okay, keep trying. There's no prohibition. There's just action and reaction. As simple as that. Nevertheless, my interaction with Fernando made up for my defeat in other areas. I feel highly edified by our conversations and felt great affection for him and an increasing gratitude for his courtesy towards me and my companions. You see? So that's another form of charity. Another form of charity. Preparing your home for the repose of the the, the caravan of spirits who need to help others on earth. I know it may be crazy. If we talk to people in the streets, they're going to say, you're crazy. It's okay. We don't care. But at least we know that our homes are cleaner. They're going to be lighter. They're going to be more soothing. It's a lighter environment, especially when we focus on the moral side. Of course, even if we don't drink alcohol, don't have physical addictions, we need also to cultivate virtues in the home. Being kind and patient and loving to one another, taming our inferior tendencies, when we keep observing those things, things become so steady vibratorily. Our energy field is solid. And then the good spirits from our protecting spirits, guardian angels, mentors, they continue using that and mag let's say magnifying it. They multiply it for us. I think this is it for today. We will continue this chapter tomorrow because there is another lesson for us there we want to focus upon. Today is about boosting our hope, being courageous, feeling the joy of living, and doing this affirmation. In the next 24 hours, let us practice this, the three steps. Huh? For the joy of living, putting God at the center of our lives, right? Mm -hmm. Seeking new opportunities to expand our abilities and helping those who are suffering much more than we are. Could be at your work, neighborhood, 
by, like Fernando Lacerda, praying for the spirits who are in need, visiting people at the hospitals, nursing homes, shelters. Shall we, friends? Let us pray now. Let us do our service together, shall we? Yes? Right, Gabriel Inácio. <laughs> Hello, Tony Torres and Gabriel Inácio. So, friends, I'm going to put the Ave Maria here for us to inspire us because she's the one that is guiding the project to help those who committed suicide. And we want to partake. Let us form this current international current of light right now. If you're watching this or listening to this on demand, you're invited to. You're invited right now because this is going to be sustained. See the light of the stars. They don't disappear. They keep traveling in space. What we're creating with God right now, co-creating with God, it's going to remain traveling. When you're watching on demand, you're joining in too, okay? Let us go. Dun, 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 dun. Dear Mother Mary, we unite our minds and hearts with yours in your legion of faithful, loyal servants. We would like to pray for those who are feeling discouraged and depressed, even suicidal. We would like to visualize that your blanket of sky blue healing light is enveloping each one of them. In new hope, And in this new hope, they can feel the rescuing guards coming to their therapy. And we visualize those who committed suicide being enveloped by your blanket of love bringing them the warmth and the relief that they need. As all of them hear your voice saying to them, my dear child, this shall pass. My dear child, this shall pass. My dear child, this shall pass. And we visualize our beautiful planet enveloped by your loving vibrations. Assuring everyone of how much they are loved. May we also renew our commitment to being more useful by taking care of ourselves even better, renewing ourselves in all possible manners and dimensions. 
may also our loved ones receive your loving care and the relief that they need. May we stay under your inspiration and protection, Mother of all mothers, as you grant us the permission to wrap up this therapeutic conversation and this service in your name and love, and so be it. Na 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 Yes, dear friends, this is Lifting Hope here at Kardec Radio, nourishing our souls always, right? Let us pray that we will be back tomorrow with one more opportunity to lift up our homes, our hopes, because after all, we are children of God. Thank you, friends. Until tomorrow, God willing.